When we first started doing work in this area, much of the research focused on very general, global questions about religion, such as, do you believe in God? How often do you go to church? What religious denomination are you? And we've learned that these questions, they can provide some useful basic information, but if we're to understand spirituality, we really have to get closer to spiritual life. We can't afford to study spirituality from a distance. So instead of asking only, do you believe in God? We need to know about the God you believe in. Tell me about the way you understand God. Tell me more about the relationship you have with God. That makes a difference. For instance, it makes a difference whether you defer the sense of responsibility for your problems to God. For instance, when you have a problem, you may say, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm giving it over to God. We call that deferring religious coping. On the other hand, you may feel that you have a relationship or a partnership with God so that when problems come up, you work together with God. God's not the only active partner. You're active too. And so you work together. And generally we find that people who have a collaborative religious coping style tend to have better mental health than people who are exclusively deferring, who just passively surrender to God. Of course, we're finding that sometimes surrender is not a bad thing. When you face the limits of your control, when you face your human finitude, sometimes saying, I've done what I can, I give up, it's yours, God, can be very helpful. Well, that has been the focus of our work for many, many years with my wonderful colleagues, uh, Annette Mahoney, Julie Exline, and my wonderful graduate students. We've been trying to identify the nuggets, the nuggets or the, the jewels, the resources in spirituality that seem to be health engendering. And we've been making progress, for instance, people who are able to interpret negative events, trauma, illness, a natural disaster, a divorce, if they can interpret that event in a larger spiritual framework so that an illness, for instance, is more than just suffering, it can be understood in a broader context, maybe an opportunity to get closer to something godly, maybe a chance to grow spiritually, or maybe there's a mysterious meaning in it that's ultimately benevolent, though we may not understand it, at least in this life. We call that benevolent spiritual reframing, a way of placing negative events in a larger spiritual context. That seems to be very helpful to people. People can also turn to the spiritual for support. They can ask God for comfort. They can ask God for strength. They can ask God for guidance. And that process of looking to God for support seems to be very helpful to people. Spiritual support may be available when no other support is around. Uh, people can find spiritual support when family and friends are lacking, when they're alone, at night, when there's no one else around. They can find it in the most difficult of circumstances. So it seems to be a kind of support that's always accessible to people. And again, it seems to be very helpful. Uh, support from religious communities is helpful as well. The support that we can gain from religious leaders, inspirational figures from religious communities seems to offer something special, a kind of uh, assistance that we get from no other place. So these are just three examples of positive religious coping resources that seem to be quite helpful to people.
Well, major life events and just the process of development can at times challenge us, even shake us in our most fundamental beliefs and assumptions, including our beliefs about God, our beliefs about faith, our beliefs about our ultimate purpose in life. A major life event such as a death, an accident, can throw our most basic beliefs into turmoil and we can be shaken to the core. What we're learning is that people can struggle then at times with their faith. We find this in the religious scriptures and literatures of almost every tradition, examples of people who struggled. Moses struggled. Jesus struggled. Buddha struggled. Struggles are part of religious life and we think they're a part of religious development for people. So we're not saying struggles are pathological, but they can lead to decline and trouble and a lot of distress, or they may potentially lead to growth and transformation. We've identified, Julie Exline and I have a new measure of spiritual struggle that we've been using, and we've identified different types of struggle. For instance, struggles with God, feeling that we may be punished, feeling that we're being abandoned by God, feeling angry at God. We can struggle with dark forces. We may feel that we're in a battle with darkness, evil, or the demonic, another kind of struggle. We can struggle with other people and with religious communities. We can struggle with the church. We can struggle with friends, family, religious leaders about spiritual matters. In that sense, atheists can struggle. We can struggle internally. We can struggle about our ultimate meaning and purpose. And sometimes we lose that or that's shaken when we start raising questions. Why am I here? Do I have an ultimate purpose in life? We can struggle with our own morality. We can struggle internally with the conflict between our higher values and our spiritual self and our impulses and a more basic human side. And we end up wondering why am I behaving the way that I'm doing in ways that are inconsistent with my values. And there are lots of examples in the religious literature of famous people who we're really struggling with their impulses. And these struggles are tied to a great deal of distress. They're tied generally to decline in physical health. They may be even tied to greater risk of mortality.